hope everyone enjoyed a lunch at the food truck. I'm Margaret Rathen, a member of the Stanford Healthcare Board and chair of the Stanford Medicine Community Council. I wanted to thank you all for being here today. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Mackey um, as a testimony to how dedicated our physicians are. Dr. Mackey got up at 2 o'clock this morning, uh, just came straight from the airport to be here today, and gets on the plane again this evening. So, um, an incredible, incredible effort to be here. Um, Dr. Mackey's, through Dr. Mackey's leadership, uh, the Stanford Pain Management Center has been designated a center of excellence by the American Pain Society twice. He is chief of the Division of Pain Medicine and is resident professor of lots of different things, which I think are on, on the screen, uh, will be on the screen. But um, if you're personally experiencing chronic pain or need to be better understanding for a loved one, you'll appreciate Dr. Mackey's approach to diagnosing and treating pain. pain. So please join me in welcoming him here today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome, everyone. I want to first just check, can you hear me OK in the back? Thumbs up? Perfect. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Great. Well, I'm excited that you're all here today and that you're interested in uh, my favorite topic, which is pain or uh, in relieving it and helping to find solutions for people with chronic pain. Uh, it turns out, yeah, turns out we've lost our video. It turns out. Well, by way of background, while we're getting this back up and running, let me just give you the briefest of introductions. So as was mentioned, I'm the division chief uh, for pain medicine here at Stanford. I've been here now for about 20 years. I did my training here. I uh, have been on the faculty for about 15 years. I still take care of patients about one day a week, the other six days. I'm in the lab. And in the lab, our mission statement is to predict, prevent, and alleviate pain through science, education, and compassion. So what we're trying to do from a research standpoint is identify those factors that cause people after an injury or after surgery to develop chronic pain, to then develop preventative factors to prevent that occurrence, and then to come up with novel, safe, and effective treatments for chronic pain for what I'll show you is the 100 million Americans out there that suffer from chronic pain. I've uh, dedicated my life. My life mission is to helping to relieve pain and suffering. I've been doing this now, as I said, for about 15 or 16 years. We work with an incredible team here uh, at Stanford. And we're going to show you some of the research that we're doing and also uh, some of the tools that we use for treating chronic pain. And then intermixed within that, I'm going to be putting in some tips that we use to help, um, help guide you and empower you in the area of chronic pain. Are we winning? If you haven't had an opportunity to uh, take a look at the booth we have out there, it's being manned by Dr. Ming Kao and then my son. Raise your arm, raise your hand, it's my son. Ian here has uh, been a part of the Stanford community since the age of two. He was born here. He's been working in the lab since the age of 10. He's now a research coordinator and uh, helping us to run some of the research studies that we're doing in pain. And again, we're going to show you some of that in just a little bit. Well done. Thank you. So let's dive in. And the big question that we always have is, what's the big deal about pain? Is it a big deal? The answer is, it's a huge deal. I was privileged to be on an Institute of Medicine report that uh, determined the burden of pain in this country. And what we found is that about 37% of the US adult population experiences chronic pain, everything from those who have self-managed their pain to truly catastrophic pain problems. And it comes at an extraordinary cost to society of about a half a trillion dollars per year. Just to put that in perspective, folks, that half a trillion a year is more than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. And as a society, we're only beginning to appreciate the true burden of chronic pain and its impact on society. We learned also that while pain is often a symptom of another condition, when it becomes persistent, when it becomes chronic, it can become a disease in and of its own right, one that fundamentally alters our nervous system and making it spread wider and actually increase in magnitude. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. On top of that, we've got this 
this other problem on our hands, which is we now have a prescription opioid epidemic in this country. Every time you open up the paper, you're seeing somebody else who's dying from prescription opioids. It's now surpassed motor vehicle accidents as the number one cause of um, accidental deaths in this country. We prescribe over 300 million prescriptions for pain medications. Um, number three on the list of all medications is Vicodin. The good news is, is that those numbers are actually going down with regard to the prescriptions. And so I am hopeful and we are putting a lot of effort into this. The other message that we gave out in the IOM report is that it is a moral imperative for all of us who care for patients to work towards improving uh, the well-being and the quality of life of those with pain. Pain we know has a hugely negative impact on people. It causes tremendous emotional distress. People get angry, they get depressed, they get anxious. Uh, they get poor sleep. I think there were some, some uh, lectures here. There were message, lectures here on sleep today. Uh, they get fatigued, and fatigue we find is one of them, both physical fatigue but also cognitive fatigue. We're learning more and more that there's decreases in social functioning and that that has a further impact on pain, an overall decrease in quality of life. And we're learning that many people who have chronic pain are doing so without adequate care and suffer often with little sense of hope. When you look at the causes of pain, the big one out there is low back pain. It is uh, accounting for about 28%, and then, no pun intended, but neck and neck, is neck pain and then headaches, followed by a number of other uh, conditions that uh, people experience. And so that's just the kind of briefest overview of that. I want to get into a little bit of the science of pain and teach you some of the, the background of how we describe pain, how pain all starts with an injury but then can become persistent and then the role of the brain in pain and so you know let's start with some of our historical views of pain and a lot of this started with this guy Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes was a 17th century French philosopher and he was a brilliant mathematician in fact many of his mathematical constructs and theorems are still used today. He invented Cartesian geometry. He's he was absolutely brilliant and a wonderful philosopher, when it, but when it came to pain, he screwed it all up. He really screwed it up. What he proposed was this dualistic view of pain, illustrated by this small child, and this illustration he drew with his foot in the fire, pulling on a delicate string, leading up into the brain, and ringing a bell in the brain, causing the little boy to withdraw his foot. He proposed this model of pain as this direct link between stimulus and perception, stimulus and response, and that there was a one-to-one -one association with that. We've now learned that that's completely wrong, but that model has permeated our philosophical underpinnings of pain, our treatment underpinnings of pain, and education all the way up through the 20th century and even now. And I'm going to show you where that went wrong and how we're correcting it talk about pain, it helps to start with some common language. We use a lot of you know, jargon in our field. My job today is not to inundate you with jargon, but to try to explain these terms. Pain, it's worth explaining and defining, has been defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Now, even that's a mouthful. So let's just boil it down to the key components. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. What that means is that pain is incredibly subjective. It is whatever you say it is. It is owned by the person who has the pain. We don't yet have any objective way of measuring it. I shouldn't say that because our lab was actually the first one to put out brain imaging biomarkers for pain that we published just recently. And we're excited that we may be able to peer into the brain and actually objectify it but it's a long way away from being used clinically. It's a subjective experience, it's very individual, and it varies from person to person. And it has this emotional component to it, and I'm gonna talk about all of these in more detail. And so, it's, you know, if you will, illustrated by this little guy here with a low back pain. Wait a minute here, Mr. Crumbly, maybe it isn't kidney stones after all. So let's start with a little bit of pain processing 101, shall we? Let's imagine, if you will, that you cut your hand. And I'm going to show this illustration here several times throughout this talk. You cut your hand, you hit your thumb with a hammer. What happens? You get this sharp jolt of pain that goes right to your brain, right? And then you have a delay when you think to yourself, 
oh darn, this is really going to hurt. And then you get that hot burning sensation. What's going on there? How do we explain that? Well, it's explained rather simply. We've learned a lot about the neurosciences of pain. We have within our skin and our soft tissues and in our bones, we have these little transducers we call nociceptors. Now a transducer, by the way, I'm an engineer in a prior life, a transducer is just something that converts one form of energy into another form. And so this microphone here is a transducer. It's converting my sound waves, the sound energy, into electrical energy. Those speakers are also transducers, converting electrical energy back into sound energy that you hear. You have all these little transducers throughout your entire body that feel things like pressure, temperature, uh, inflammation, and it sends these little electrical signals through your nerves through something called an action potential. It's just an electrical signal that's transmitted up the nerve fibers. And there's two types of these nerve fibers. There's a nerve fiber we call A delta, and there's one we call C fibers. Now the A delta fires, they fa they're fast conducting. They're wicked fast. About 10 meters a second is how quickly they are. And the C fibers, they're unshielded, they're kind of bare cables, and they're slow. They're slow. So when you hit your thumb with a hammer, that sharp jolt, sharp jolt, jolt of brain, uh, pain that goes right to your brain, those are your A delta fibers, fibers firing off, 10 meters a second. Then you have this delay while your C fibers are kicking in. And it takes, they, they're transmitting at about a meter a second, and it takes about a meter to a meter and a half, a second to a second and a half to get up to your brain. And that's why you have this delay. And what you notice is that you have two entirely different sensations after you hit your thumb with a hammer. Go home tonight and hit your thumb with a hammer and check it out for yourself. Or hit, hit your friend's thumb with a hammer and ask them, <laughs> go, run a, go run an experiment. Again, sharp jolt of pain, it's prickly, it's well localized. You know exactly where it is. And then a delay, oh darn, really going to hurt. And then hot burning sensation comes over your thumb. And it's flooding. It's a much broader area. And for the first time, you start noticing also an emotional component to it. You really don't like this. What's going on there? Well, these fibers, they, they make some connections in our spinal cord. They cross over to the other side and they head up to the brain, where ultimately the perception of pain is processed. And it becomes the experience of pain. It's, these signals are sent off to multiple areas in the brain, and different qualities of pain then occur. This story wouldn't be complete if we didn't have some way of controlling it. If, if we were bombarded just by signals all the time and we had to pay attention to them, our brains would explode. And so what's happened over all of these kajillions of years is we've developed these descending inhibitory pathways, these inhibitory pathways that come down from the brain into the spinal cord, and they serve the purpose of filtering out unimportant signals. So a large part of your nervous system is there to filter out things that aren't important. You're probably not paying attention to the sound of like the air conditioning as it's going on right now and the fan until you focus attention on it. It's the same with pain. In any given time, you live in this balance between the signals that are heading up and the signals that are heading down. And I'm going to get to that here in just a second in just describing what's going on with chronic pain. And what I mean by that is at any given time, you've got these signals that are coming up from your body into your brain. And at the same time, this inhibit, inhibition of signals coming down that are trying to turn it down. And in a normal situation, ideally with normal signals hitting your body, you're in a state of homeostasis and you don't feel any pain. But what's going on with chronic pain is typically one of two things or both. And that is you either have an injury out here that's sending off these electrical signals and you've got too much drive going up to your brain or you have too little inhibition that's coming down from your brain. The latter we're finding from a research standpoint is playing a larger and larger role in what's going on with chronic pain conditions that we're finding that in many conditions any, how many of you heard of fibromyalgia? There you go. Fibromyalgia is thought to be a dysfunction in this inhibition. It's when the inhibition goes haywire. How many of you heard of diabetic neuropathy? Okay, there you go. What's going on with diabetic neuropathy is a lot of the inhibition is lost in inhibitory fibers out here in the periphery. And so a lot of the medications that I'm going to talk with you about are trying to crank up the inhibition. Let's go back here, and I'm just going to take a step back and uh, keep this story going. 
Now what I've been showing you out here is not pain. This, folks, is not pain. It's a fancy word called nociception because it's that activation of those nociceptors. It's a terrible term. I wish we could come up with a nicer, cleaner, easier to remember term than nociception. But if you just think about it as what goes on out here is not pain, what's going on in your back is not actually pain. It's crazy mixed up signals that are being sent up to the brain. And it's not until it hits the brain that it becomes pain. And the interesting thing here is that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. These signals down here, these nociceptive signals, are changed. They're amplified. They're turned down by a multitude of other factors. Some under your control, some not under your control. So for instance, the genes that your parents handed down to you make you either more or less sensitive to certain types of pain. My genes, and I think my son's genes, made me very insensitive to heat. I do great in the heat. I'm lousy in the cold. I'm a, I run a pain lab, so I mean I subject myself to pain all the time. I know exactly what my sensitivities are. Everybody's here is tuned a little differently, and I'll show you some of that. But also there's other things, such as cognition, the degree to which you attend to pain. You distract yourself from pain. How many of you heard of this, can, this thing called catastrophizing? You heard of that? Catastrophizing is this trifecta. It's made up of three things. It's negative amplification of pain. You tend to think the pain is worse and worse and worse. Rumination. You can't get your mind off the pain. You have repetitive thoughts about it all the time. And then probably most importantly is a sense of loss of control or helplessness. You feel you have no control over the pain. Catastrophizing has the biggest predictor of bad outcomes in chronic pain than anything we've been able to identify. When people are depressed or anxious or angry, they have more pain. Um, I mentioned some of the individual difference with genetics. Early life experiences. And so if you, during, as a child, were either physically, emotionally, sexually abused, it wires your brain such that you may be more vulnerable for the development of chronic pain later on. And so we're learning that what happens in childhood has a huge impact in what happens later on as adults. Oh, this kind of illustrates my point. The mind, the mind can be controlled. Now I have thought about the human mind. And it is proving to be an inconvenience. Okay. Let's talk about Spock's inconvenient human half, shall we? Pain is a thing of the mind. The mind can be controlled. And so we have learned that many of these factors that I mentioned can actually be controlled. I spent a large part of the research in our lab learning how to help people control their brain, control their mind, and thereby teach them skills to reduce pain. Through that, we've learned many of the brain systems involved with this. And so we've learned that there are brain regions like the thalamus that acts like a big relay station, taking these signals coming up and sending them out. The somatosensory cortex involved with kind of the location of your pain. Where is it located in, on your body? The anterior cingulate cortex, some of the emotional aspects of pain, how unpleasant it is, the suffering, if you will, of pain. The insular cortex involved with your internal awareness of your bodily state. How are you feeling internally right at this moment? And the list goes on. And so what we're finding is that many of these same regions overlap with our emotional regions of the brain. I do brain imaging for a living, so I have to have at least one rotating brain in my slide deck. This is a rotating brain here. And this shows a cutout of what's called your limbic system, your emotional brain. And what we've learned through a lot of brain imaging is that these regions of the brain involved with your processing, your experience of emotions, overlap exactly with the same areas involved with the processing of pain. And so if you ever notice that when you're anxious, when you're angry, if you've had a fight with your spouse or your boss, and your neck is like acting up or your back is kind of increasing, you feel, you're feeling more stressed, well, there's a, well, welcome to the human race because there is a physiologic basis for why you're experiencing what you're experiencing because these uh, systems overlap exactly. And I spend a lot of time trying to understand and figure out these systems. Now, what's going on when chronic pain develops. A lot of pain started with an injury or a surgery. How many people know of somebody, yourself, a loved one, in which 
their chronic pain all started with some surgery, with some injury, some incident or trauma. There you go. So let's go back to this hand, if we will. And let's imagine that there was a cut on the hand or an injury on the hand. You get that sharp jolt of pain, goes right to the brain. Oh, darn, really going to hurt. Hot burning sensation comes over the hand. About an hour later, what you find is an increase in swelling and redness and an increase in pain around this area. That's through a release of inflammatory mediators. There's a lot of chemicals get released into that area to try to heal up the area. And that's called what we call primary hyperalgesia is the technical term. But the really interesting thing is what happens when you go to bed, you wake up the next day, and you find now doesn't your whole hand the next day feel kind of stiff, aching, and sore? Think about the last time you twisted your ankle stepping off a curb or while you were running. And you wake up the next day, and doesn't the whole lower part of your leg and your foot feel stiff, aching, and sore? What's happened overnight? Well, what's happened is your nervous system is completely rewired. Your, your spinal cord and your brain. If you were to sample the tissue, if you were to look at the tissue out here, you'd see that the tissue is entirely normal, but it hurts, it's aching, it's painful. Why? Because what's happened here is the amplifiers, those things I'd mentioned before, have now all been turned up. They've been dialed up to a higher level. It's like turning your stereo amplifier up to a higher notch so that you're experiencing more pain for the same amount of what was now normal stimulation. Why? Why does that occur? Well, think about it. It serves a survival message for us. Imagine you're back in the cave, cave people time, and you've been injured by a woolly mammoth or a saber-toothed tiger. Your arm is injured. It was in your best interest to go sit in a cave or a dark, quiet, controlled place and let nature take its course and heal you up. Heal you up rather than going back out to fight the woolly mammoth or saber-toothed tiger. Because if you went out and fought the saber-toothed tiger while you were injured, what would happen to you? You would get eaten. And you can't then pass your genes down. This occurs in humans, and this same phenomenon occurs at least in, mo in all mammals and many uh, non-vertebrate animals. And so it's in there, it's conserved, it serves a survival basis for all of us. What happens in a normal situation is you heal up, those signals and the spreading shrinks back down, you go back to things as normal, and everything's good. What we're believing is occurring in chronic pain, and those people particularly who are vulnerable, is those neural switches are not turning off. And they can continue to spread and grow. And we think in part fibromyalgia and other chronic painful conditions are like that, that they are continuing to expand and grow so that sometimes you feel pain over very large parts of your body. And what a lot of research is spending time in doing is trying to understand these neural switches and to turn them off. Now I alluded to the fact that Rene Descartes got it all wrong, that there's a not a nice linear one-to-one -one relationship between the stimulus and your experience of pain. And this is what we've learned over the years. And that is um, that there's huge individual variability in pain. And we're trying to figure out why for a given injury, for a given stimulus, there is such huge variability. Why for a given injury is there such a huge variability in the amount of uh, disability that we see amongst people? Why is there such a large variability who will, uh, people who will develop chronic pain after injury or surgery? About 10% of people after a major surgery will develop some degree of chronic pain. Our lab and others are trying to figure out those factors. We think we're getting a better handle on it. And then we're starting to put preventative measures into play. And why is there such a large variability in response to analgesic agents? Here's one of the dirty little secrets of medicine, at least in pain medicine. I've been doing this a long time. And I'm reasonably well at, good at this. And I'll tell you that for a given painful condition and a given person, I usually am batting about 400 or 500. That means I'm getting it right about 40 to 50 percent of the time with choosing a given medication for a given condition. And that means that we have to go through this very laborious trial and error process of medication after medication until we find something that works for an individual person. It's frustrating for the person with pain. It's frustrating for me and my colleagues because we all want to help you out. 
And we would rather, we would rather be able to identify the specific medication for the specific person and the specific condition and have a high degree of confidence it's going to work. That's, by the way, what President Obama has called for for precision medicine. That is what our dean has called for with precision health, expanding even precision medicine more broadly. And that's a large part of what our research mission and my life's mission has been in the development of open source and free tools to help to develop this precision medicine platform. We have one that you can go online. It's called CHOIR, the Collaborative Health Outcomes Information Registry that we're giving away to other academic centers to help collect all the information to characterize you to be able to do that precision health. So let's look at some of the data here, if you will. This was a seminal study done a long time ago. They took 500 people, about twice the number of people in this room, and they asked everybody how much pain they had after they got a 49 degrees Celsius stimulus. It's about 121 degrees Fahrenheit on their hand. What they found is they rank ordered them. This is the pain scale from 0 to 100. And they find that there were people down here that had no pain. There were people here that had mild, some medium, some more severe. And then, oh my god, this is the worst I've ever imagined. Get this off me immediately. Huge variability for the same stimulus. Same stimulus. And is this just kind of an artifact? Is this an uncommon group of people? Does this occur across the board? Well, I'll tell you. It occurs in physicians, too. I teach the medical school courses here on pain, and I do an experiment on them. Actually, I don't call it an experiment because I have to consent them. It's a demonstration. I do a demonstration on the medical students, and I ask them to stick their hand in a circulating ice water bath, a cold, cold ice water bath for 15 seconds. They pull their arm out, and they whisper their pain score and a research assistant, and then we tabulate it, and what we find is exactly the same curve. That we have medical students who say, you know what, that's not painful at all. I could say, keep my hand in there all day. Some mildly painful, some moderate, and some, oh my god, that's the worst thing imaginable. I, cold, cold wise, uh, I'd probably be up around here for this. On heat, I would be down here, is where I typically am. Huge individual variability for the same stimulus. Why do I do this to the medical students, by the way? It is a little bit of fun. Stan, you're right. <laughs> Stan is right. It is a little bit of fun. But there's actually an educational benefit to it. We tend, as humans, to naturally project our own ratings of pain onto other people. And what I'm trying to teach these young doctors is to not make preconceived notions of how much another person's pain, how much they're experiencing. Instead, ask them and take, take it at face value when they tell you how much pain it is. And maybe the amount of injury, the amount of disease burden may not reflect how much pain you would have uh, at that moment, but that's why we shouldn't be judgmental. That it's better to be empathetic and caring. And that's what I think this helps demonstrate. Bob Coghill uh, at Awake Forest took the same exact study with heat, and he took those with low sensitivity, those with high sensitivity, and he stuck them in a brain imaging scanner. And what he finds is, the cool thing is, that all of the individual differences are accounted for in brain regions. And these brain regions are ones I showed you before. But here on, a, on an actual brain slice, the somatosensory cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, here are the prefrontal cortex, some of the evaluative and thinking aspects of pain. And so we're able to better understand some of these individual differences. Now I'll share with you, back in the day, uh, my original life was as an engineer. I've got my bachelor's and master's is in bioengineering, my PhD's in electrical engineering. Coming out of medical school, you could not have found anyone more mechanistic and linear than me. I was convinced that if I could just distill down a person's issues into an equation, into a system, I could solve it. Done. This can't be that hard. Until I started getting into the clinics and listening to people and talking with people and understanding what was going on. And I realized that the emotional state, how people were feeling and experiencing pain, was often playing a larger role uh, than anything that I was doing from regards to medications or procedures. And so it set me on a journey to try to understand that. I'm still an engineer and I want to understand the wiring, so I applied that to the brain. 
One of the areas that I've had a lot of interest in is fear and anxiety. We've understood throughout the ages that people higher in fear and higher in anxiety are more likely to develop chronic pain after an injury, are more likely to have bad outcomes with chronic pain, and I want to understand why. And so we did some early studies on this in which we characterized how much fear of pain people have. Using some surveys, it characterized how much fear do you have to a paper cut, to getting your arm broken, to having a surgical procedure. And what we found is this insanely high correlation, this area of the brain called the right orbital frontal cortex. This is the same area here in three different views of the brain. And it sits right over here, and it's involved with evaluating inputs that come in from your body and your emotional inputs, consolidating them, and then making decisions about what to do with them. And let me give you just a quick demonstration of why that one is important. And so I'm going to ask for a volunteer, somebody to volunteer. Could it be young man over here? Would you, would you be willing to volunteer? <laughs> Come on on up. <laughs> so, here you are. You're th I want you to imagine you're three years old. You're three years old, and you're over at your grandmother's house. Okay. You come on up here, and you see this really cool-looking casserole dish that's sitting on her stove. So you walk up to the casserole dish. Go ahead. Okay. And you start to pick up that casserole dish. That casserole dish, you go ahead and pick it up, and you find out it's incredibly, 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 pick it up, take it off. It's incredibly burning hot. You're three years old. What are you going to do? You're going to throw that thing on the floor, right? Okay. Now, how old are you now? 17. 17. Let's imagine you've got another eight years on you. You're 25. You've got, a, you've got another about eight years before your orbital frontal cortex fully develops. You're almost there. <laughs> but I think you're going to get this one. You're now, and so you're 17. You go to your grandmother's. You see this beautiful casserole dish. You pick it up. Go ahead. And you note it's burning hot. Now, this is your grandmother's favorite casserole dish in the whole world. What are you going to do? You're going to put that one back down. Your orbital frontal cortex was firing off like crazy right there because it was allowing you to take the information in about pain, but to modulate it by understanding what the implications are of your actions, and in this case, make the correct action because you did not want to upset your grandmother. Right? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> That's one of the roles of the orbital frontal cortex here in this. This is why it's critically important in pain. We're learning that that area gets dysfunctional in chronic pain. It also gets very dysfunctional in chronic pain. What about anxiety? We did the same thing in anxiety, and we find that those people who have more anxiety about their bodily symptoms have more dysfunction, more uh, activity in this area called the medial prefrontal cortex. This same area, by the way, is, in, is dysfunctional in generalized anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress, and it has direct connections down in those, those inhibitory systems in the brain. So we think that people higher in somatic anxiety don't inhibit as well. And so for the same amount of stimulus coming in, less inhibition. Okay, that's just a real, a little bit of a, a teaser on some of the science of pain. I want to move in now with the remaining time and just talk a little bit about some of the treatments that we use. You're going to need the right tools for the job. If you don't have the right tools, you're going to get awfully frustrated. So hot oil, we need hot oil. Forget the water balloons. And so you want to have the right tools for the job in managing pain. What are those tools? I break it down into six different pillars. And those different pillars, those different approaches include the following. Self-management, teaching you skills on how to better manage and uh, care for what, what problem you have. The medications, psychological and behavioral approaches, physical and occupational therapy. We do procedural and surgical, and then also complementary and alternative, and I'm going to whip through a bunch of these. A little bit more focus on the medications with some tips for the medications. And so what you'll find in pain management from a medication standpoint is that we steal from everybody. We steal everybody else's drugs. Many of the ones we use are, are taken off-label. And we find that they often work better for pain than the original condition for which they were FDA approved. There's nothing fundamentally wrong about using an off-label drug. 
we want to make sure that we're using an off-label drug with good data and evidence behind it. And so we take from the uh, neurologists their anti-seizure drugs, which work in similar uh, areas of the brain involved with pain in similar ways that they work for seizures. Now, these are not going to cause you seizures, but they do turn down some of the noise of pain. The antidepressants often crank up that inhibition. They work on circuits in the brain that bolster and beef up your inhibitory systems. The antiarrhythmics, these are anti-cardiac arrhythmia drugs, turn down some of the noise and nerve pain. And then we have opioids, NSAIDs. Our group here and some others are, are studying, I've got some research studies on some novel, what we call glial cell inhibitors that have been found effective for fibromyalgia and some other conditions. One of the misconceptions, this is one of the first, one of the tips, is people are concerned that these medications just hide the pain. And that's really not what's going on at all. They will not change the way that you experience a normal nociceptive stimulus. Like if you go, if you're on these medications and you cut your hand, you're going to feel that cut just like anybody else uh, who's not on these medications. What they do is they reduce that central sensitization that I described before. They turn the volume down on the abnormal pain. They reduce that abnormal firing and try to bring you back to a normalized state. That's the purpose. That and to help you to ultimately increase your function and movement. One of the key messages with medications, and I alluded to this before with individual differences, is that everybody responds to medications differently. You're going to have a different analgesic response. You're going to have a different side effect profile. And we're honestly not able to predict exactly for one particular person how they're going to respond. So that's where communication with your, your physician and reporting to them any specific side effects is going to be important. Because of this opioid epidemic that we have, we're spending a lot of time helping to educate people about proper use of their opioids. One of the biggest problems that we find is that there's too much opioids that are getting out into the community and not being used. And so, for instance, after a small surgery, maybe somebody is prescribed 30 days of Vicodin or Percocet. You take one of them and it makes you sick to your stomach. You put it away in your medicine cabinet and it just sits there. And then what you find is that little Johnny or little Susie, who's a teenager, grabs it and goes and uses it at a party. That occurs all the time. So one of the key messages here is that you know, your medications are yours only. Don't share it with others ever. If your friend is saying that they've got a bad migraine or that they just drenched their knee and they want ask if they can borrow some of your Vicodin or Percocet, just say, you know, do whatever you need to do. Tell a white lie and say you don't have any. Um, just tell them that they need to go see a physician for some appropriate prescribing. These opioid medications in the first line, they can be an appropriate treatment, but they're not frequently the first line of treatment. There's many other choices. Make sure you store your medications in a safe place where children or pets can't reach it. Dispose of the medications that have not been used. Don't just let them sit there in your medicine cabinet. If you have a safe, put them in a safe and lock them away. They are a controlled substance. Take medication only if it's been prescribed or approved by your doctor. Don't take it more frequently, more often, or differently than the way it was originally prescribed. And if you are having worsening of pain, contact your physician and let them know. And then additionally, combination of these opiate medications with other medications like um, benzodiazepines, such as alcohol, can be a really bad combination. And when you look at the deaths that occur out there, when you read about them in the newspapers, more often than not, it's due to multiple medications or multiple things taken at the same time. We do a lot of procedural treatments in pain, as pain medicine. We do everything from trigger point injections. We do Botox, not for wrinkles, but we do it for muscle spasms and for pain, also for migraines. We do different types of nerve blocks. We do ablative therapies. We put in spinal drug delivery systems and spinal cord stimulators, all with the game, all with the idea of reducing your pain and improving your level of function and quality of life. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail on that. But I'm happy to answer questions at the end. 
Pain psychology, probably one of the most underappreciated and underused, underutilized tools in America. It is uh, an incredibly powerful approach to chronic pain. The purpose of pain psychology is not to get you lying on a couch and talking about your relationship with your mother, okay? It's, it's about empowering you. It's about teaching you skills. It's about helping you to learn how to best manage your pain and also how to change your brain, to teach you techniques and skills to change your brain to better control your pain. There's a number of different approaches that we use. We often get the spouse involved. These are some of the names of the different approaches, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, acceptance and commitment, catastrophizing treatment. I'll tell you I've been through mindfulness-based stress reduction twice, once alone, once with my son. Why? Because I kept sending patients to it, and they kept getting better. And I'm a curious person, and I wanted to know why, so I went through it myself. And I found it to be incredibly helpful. They're now putting this in the high schools. They've got the surgeons here, the surgical residents doing NBSR. It's just being spread uh, everywhere. And I have a very large grant I'll show you at the end that's studying the mechanisms of it. The purpose of pain psychology is ultimately to take what is often a, uh, a small stimulus, something that may be uh, firing, misfiring, here and prevent it from becoming this. This is what happens when all those amplifiers in the brain that I showed you before get cranked up. And what you can do with pain psychology and some of these mind-body approaches is learn how to turn that back down. We also use a number of CAM approaches, acupuncture, over-the-counter nutraceuticals. These are the things you buy at general nutrition store or a, a vitamin shop or I don't have any financial relationships with any of them. Pick your, your, your stores of choice. There are a number of these agents that have actually been subjected to randomized controlled trials and shown benefit for uh, different chronic painful conditions. Acetyl-L-carnitine, alpha-lipoic acid, um, fish oil. There's a number of them that have been helpful. And then I've also put mindfulness-based stress reduction under CAM approaches, although it's becoming more and more mainstream. Physical and occupational therapy movement approaches, we use this extensively, setting goal-oriented, uh, setting paced activities, setting goals, getting people moving. We find more and more that movement in a structured way rewires your brain and actually turns down those amplifiers. The more pain tips. The most effective ways that I've found for people to deal with their clinicians around pain is to talk about your hopes and expectations, to set specific goals for functional activities that you have. I will often say to a person with pain, if I were able to take my magic Harry Potter wand and take away all of your pain, what would you be doing different next week or next month? What more would you be doing? Let's talk about setting some goals and let's start working towards those. While we're trying to reduce your pain, I tend to find that those people who can set those goals and we can work towards them often end up doing much better than those who just focus on reducing that pain score. Discuss the daily activities and quality of life with your physician on a regular basis, the expectations of the outcome of pain treatment with your doc, and then again non-opioid based approaches, some of which I've uh, mentioned to you and there's a large number of others, and recognize that people with chronic pain are going to have good days, they're going to have bad days. And the key in this is generally to increase your activity, your movement, your function in a stable, slow, increasing manner. The mistake that people make is that when they have good days, they go out like gangbusters, they overdo it, and then what happens? They pay for it the next three to five days, lying in bed, recovering from that one good day. And you get into this roller coaster, this vicious cycle that just takes a toll. There are better ways of doing that to ultimately get people uh, to higher levels of function. It's more like training for a marathon with slow incremental increases than sprinting. Let me close out on one last uh, fun study that I did, and this is around love. And love is not a live opioid releasing viral endosome. Nope. This is the real thing. So let me kind of tell you, let me tell you how we get our ideas around here. So. Um, I do neurosciences around pain. 
uh, the neuroscience geeks, we all go to the Society for Neuroscience. It's this international meeting, about 40,000, 50,000 neuroscientists hang out. And I was sitting there having a couple glasses of some good Zinfandel, and I was hanging out with a buddy of mine, Art Aaron. His, he and his wife study passionate love. He's a professor also. And he's, he, he's into passionate love, and I'm into pain. I'm discussing the neural systems. <laughs> you can see where this is going. I'm discussing the neural systems of pain. He's discussing the neural systems of love. And I said, has anybody ever looked at this intersection? This intersection of kind of our reward systems with love and our pain systems. And we had some more wine. And he said, no, nobody's ever done this. And so I came back to Stanford. And I gave this to one of our po young postdocs, who's now an associate professor at uh, University of Alabama, Jared Younger. And I said, we're either going to hit the ball out of the park on this, or we're going to fall flat on our face. But let's go take it on. So we decided to take it on. We took on early phase of a romantic relationship, passionate love, when you're deeply, deeply focused on the person that you're in love with, that you feel great when you're with them. You feel terrible when you're not with them and you just crave their presence. Doesn't that just sound like an addiction, folks? And it turns out it is. Passionate love is an addiction. And through Art's work and others, they've discovered a lot of the neural systems in passionate love. And then through Nora Volkow, the director of NIDA, also the neural systems of addiction. What we find is that of these multiple systems, these guys here, these reward systems, if you will, the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental play key roles, they're involved with the release of dopamine, our feel-good neurotransmitter. This is the neurotransmitter that gets released um, when uh, somebody takes, uh, does heroin or cocaine uh, or when I eat a little dark chocolate at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I get a little release of, of dopamine. And passionate love cranks this up as well. And the question here, is there an intersection between these brain systems, these reward systems, and then some of the descending inhibitory opioid-based systems involved with pain? And so here's what we did. Well, here's what we did with this. I came back to Stanford. We put out flyers on Stanford's campus, and we just asked a simple question, are you in love? And literally within a couple hours, we had 16 Stanford couples banging on our door saying, we're in love, we're in love, study us. <laughs> Because it turns out that when you're young and when you're in love, you want the whole world to know it. And so we said, bring us pictures of your beloved and bring us pictures of an equally attractive acquaintance. And we had all sorts of fun rating the attractiveness of these people, by the way. And by the way, clothed. This is love. It's not lust. Okay? Clothed headshots. And so then what we do is we would flash them pictures of their beloved and we would cause them pain we would flash them pictures of an equally attractive acquaintance and we would cause them pain. And then we had to have a control condition because being in love is very attentionally demanding. And so we did a word generation task and we had them you know, name every sport that doesn't involve a ball. If you think about it, you know, frisbee, hockey, you know, it's, it's cognitively demanding and we cause you pain. So what, what did we find? We find that love works great, folks. Love works great. It leads to about a 44% reduction in moderate pain. Incredible. And we found out that the more in love you are, the more pain relief you get. Now, how do we know how much in love you are? Because the psychologists have got a scale for everything. And so they've got a passionate love scale that gets at what percentage of the time, your day, do you spend thinking about your beloved? We had Stanford students thinking about their beloved 80% of the day. It was crazy. It's insane. It's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. They had three times the analgesia. All right, then we, we did the same experiment and we stuck them in a scanner. And what did we find doing the same exact experiment? Lo and behold, boom, we get this huge activation in these reward systems and nucleus accumbens in the brain intersecting with this area called the periaqueductal gray. This is involved with your endogenous opioids, your natural pain relieving chemicals, and they're talking with each other just beautifully. What is a take home message on this? Well, I can't write you a, passionate, a prescription for a passionate love affair every six months. I can't do that. Maybe in Vegas you can get away with that. But what I can tell you to do is go out and find something that is emotionally salient, that's novel, that's exciting for you to do. Take a walk on a moonlit beach, go read some exciting new book, listen to some great music. And what you'll find is through these activation of these systems that it's often pain relieving and that you will in fact feel better. So the message is get out there and engage with life that is interesting. So let me close out and say that we know that chronic pain has a tremendous impact on both the individual their family, but also society as a whole, that it can cause changes throughout the entire nervous system that can make it persistent and amplify it.
But, and it's not all about what's going on in your body. And by the way, to be clear, it's not in your head, but it is in your brain. And it's not all about the brain, it's about both. It's about the body and the brain. And so what we do is we try to target everything to give you back control of your life. There's a lot of treatments available. Please talk to your doc or ask for a referral. With regard to our center here, we're probably the largest tertiary referral center west of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's got a big center. We have uh, 24 faculty here all boarded in pain medicine. We've got one of the only inpatient chronic pain programs in the country. We've won the Center of Excellence Award back to back now. And we offer a huge selection of different approaches uh, to pain. And so by, if, if we can be of ever help to you, please let us know. Where's the future going? You're going to hear, hopefully hear a lot about this. Uh, I just co-chaired this effort from uh, Health and Human Services. We just released this from HHS. It's a national pain strategy. It consists of 17 tactical goals on how to improve the state of pain in this country. And we're, gonna, we're starting to get the legislators, our congressmen and women, involved with um, putting some resources and energy behind this. We hope to be getting a lot of effort, a lot of push on it. Get out there, download it, take a look at it, get involved. The patient advocacy groups are also putting a lot of effort behind this. Let me close out the last two slides here. We do a lot of research around pain. We've got a large NIH grant that's understanding the mechanisms of different treatments for pain. We've got four free, free, my favorite four letter F word, free treatments for chronic low back pain. Uh, actually, technically it's five because we just got another grant. Acupuncture, mindfulness-based stress reduction. We do some real-time brain feedback and then cognitive behavioral therapy. If you go to this website, snapple.stanford.edu back pain study, back pain study. Um, you can take an online screener and we'll see about your eligibility. Lastly, because we want to uh, also give back to the community, we're going to hold another event. We've been doing this every year. It's a free back pain education day. It'll be on September 11th of this year. And if you've got back pain or just any chronic pain, Come and uh, spend the day with us. We're going to have a whole day devoted to pain. And we're going to also live stream it out uh, as well. So registration is open on backpainday.stanford.edu. With that, let me close out. I want to take questions, but I first want to thank you for coming and spending uh, the day here. The team here with Health Matters has just done an extraordinary job. They really have. I hope you've been enjoying yourself, and uh, thank you for letting me come and talk. Thank you. Let's just dive right into questions. If you are a, uh, if you got a loud voice, just throw it out there and project. Otherwise, we've got some nice people here with microphones. Yes. Thank you. Virtual reality. Maybe we will get a microphone. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, my question is, we are hearing so much about virtual reality, living in Silicon Valley, you cannot ignore those kind of things because a lot happening in that space. Yes. Uh, could you please share your thoughts about pain and virtual reality? Is it just a disruption or is it more than that? That's a great question. Jeremy Balinson here runs the VR. Uh, lab. I think he's got a booth. Ian, doesn't he have a, didn't you tell me he's got a booth here? I encourage you to go take a look at it. I'm on uh, the dissertation uh, committee for one of his grad students, uh, Andrea Wen, who just did some VR work in pain, some really cool stuff. And what is actually going on, I don't really know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, really, I'm, I'm fine with telling you what I know and what I don't know. What a lot of people proposed is that this is a really highly effective distraction technique. I don't think that's what's going on here. Personally, I think that it's, it's a much deeper, there's a much deeper effect going on um, within the brain. And I think at some level it's interacting with our systems involved with consciousness. Because the fact is, is that when you're in a VR world, or when you're actually doing something, and you've got, you're, you're experiencing something out here, some nociception, people often don't have any pain in that state. It's not just a simple distraction. So I think what we need to do is figure out exactly what is going on. I think that the first steps that we're taking with VR, putting people in uh, Snow World or Cool or these other kind of video environments that are both highly distracting and maybe modulate our consciousness is just the first step. I think where the real future of this is, is using VR as an educational tool to enhance 
for instance, pain psychology to enhance some of the treatments that we use to better empower you. Because ultimately what we want to have happen with VR is that when you take the goggles off, you still you have the skills to actually take it to the next step where you can reduce your pain without having to wear the goggles 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Make sense? This is the problem sometimes with hypnosis is when you're hypnotized, your pain goes down, but when you're not hypnotized, your pain comes back. Yeah. It is, it is. And I do a lot of work in something real-time uh, brain feedback. So I can put you in a scanner and have you feedback brain systems and control your own pain. Huge individual variability in people who can do that and can't do that. We're still trying to figure out what makes those individual differences. That's part of, that's part of this big grant that we have from the NIH is to figure out the individual differences for all of these treatments. This is why the, the, the science is exciting and fun right now. It's really uh, intriguing because it's opening up the world, uh, uh, you know, knowledge of what makes you all so unique and how we can figure out what works for whom and why. Next question. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. He beat you to it, but he's going to get... Oh, no, it is, it is coming to you. It's just team effort here with a mic. Thank you for that seminar. Um, I was wondering if there have been any developments in the pain in arthritis area. Um, some knowledge aspects around it. So one of the most exciting things is, again, in the spirit of this dualistic approach, we were all pretty convinced that the amount of radiographic evidence of damage in your knee and your hip was a direct correspondence to how much pain you have. And there's this huge national database. I think it's being administered up at UCSF. And they came out with some papers recently that showed that the amount of damage, radiographic evidence of damage in your knee has zero correspondence to a person's pain. And so we find a complete decoupling of that, fitting this dualistic approach. So that's a knowledge standpoint. Now let's get back to the treatment aspect of your question. Um, what we're finding a lot is that uh, while surgery was often being recommended for some of these earlier approaches, recommending more and more rehab approaches and building up the supporting muscles and structures around the joints. There are a variety of these medications. We're finding that with arthritis, it's not just about the joint. It's about the neural systems in the brain. And so we're finding that a lot of the medications that we've used for nerve pain, they work for arthritis too because what's happening with arthritis is it's cranking up those amplifiers here. By using those meds, we can turn down the amplifiers and improve the pain. Uh, Eli Lilly got duloxetine, which is an antidepressant, I think approved for musculoskeletal pain, and it's shown some efficacy in some arthritis. Next question, and I know we're, we're starting to... Time for one more question. Time for one more question. Yes, sir. I found that I think physicians are overreacting to the press of uh, bad press of the misuse of opioids, yeah. and they're failing to prescribe it in cases where it would really benefit someone's pain. Yeah, there is a lot of emotional hyperbole out there. There's a lot of rhetoric. It's an election year. It's, <laughs> um, you got a lot of people yelling at each other. And unfortunately, right now, the people I think that are yelling the loudest are the people whose lives have been destroyed by prescription opioids, uh, opioid uh, abuse, misuse, and deaths. It is absolutely tragic when somebody lose a loses a loved one from either a morphine or an Oxycontin or a heroin overdose. It's tragic. And they have a right to yell, and they have a right to be angry. The legislators are listening to those voices. What we need to hear is more voices like yours. We need a balanced message, sir. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.